You know, I always say that in life, we get to choose who we follow. We don't get to choose how we follow that person. When I was asked to join the cartel, uh, there was a group of five people that would eventually become the Medellin Drug Cartel with one leader at that time. His name was Manny. So when I was asked to join, I had a choice. I could join or not. What I did not have a choice was how I chose to join or who I chose to follow or how I chose to follow that person. So I had a choice. I could say yes or no. I didn't have a choice in saying, well, I'll follow you, but I'll follow you under this terms and I'll do this and I'll do that. And that's how life really is, right? We get to choose who we follow. We don't get to choose how we follow that person. So now as we call ourselves Christians, it simply means something real simple. We are a follower of Jesus, right? So that's what. So we either choose to be a Christian or not. No one puts a gun in our head. But we don't get to choose how we follow Jesus. He tells us real simple. So then, as we want to find out uh, how and what entails to really be a follower of Jesus, it's real simple. The Bible tells us. When Jesus was asked of all the commandments, which one was the most important? So this Pharisee came to him and asked him this question. And Jesus answered, remember now, he's being asked, which one? There's over 660 some odd commandments, over 600, I don't remember the exact number. Uh, out of the 10 that Moses gave them, by the time Jesus came, there was over 600. And so when he's asked out of those 600 plus, which one is the most important? Jesus said, love God with all thy spirit, mind and soul, and love thy neighbor. Or love thy brother. So you wonder, well, he was asked to name one, so that was love God, and then a second one would be love thy neighbor. No. If you look at the Greek construction, that and is a consequential, which means you choose, you love God with all your heart, spirit, and soul, and then it is evidence. The evidence that you love God is that you love your neighbor. So it's only one commandment. You know, I heard my pastor say, uh, or Andy Stanley talks about the vertical and horizontal relationship with God, right? So vertically, God and us at the bottom, so we choose to follow God on the top. And then horizontal is how do we prove that we are a follower of Christ is because we love our neighbor. Think about that. We can say that we are a Christian and a follower of Jesus and say the hateful and ugly things that we say. And hate the people that we hate. And constantly be on social media talking about how the end of the world on, on, and on, and on. Nobody knows when the world will end. Nobody knows when this republic will end. Nobody knows what will destroy America. God knows. Especially if we say that we are one country under God. Think about that. But yet, we are so smart. And we know so much. And we will tell. And, and we can spew this hatred and get others to hate. And allow social media to engage us because the more we hate, the more we get engaged. And the more we get engaged, the more money they make. <clears throat> so there we are. So at the end of the day, we wonder why people and nobody wants to be, this young generation doesn't want to be a Christian. They don't have a problem with loving Jesus. They just have a problem with loving us. Look, there's a lot of people that I have a hard time loving. There's a lot of people that I know that are unlovable. But yet... As a follower of Jesus, I choose to love them. So therefore, when people ask me, what do I think about this president or that other president? I tell them, I don't care. All I'm asked to do is to love that person. I don't know. I don't know. I don't depend upon him or her to do anything for me. All I'm asked is to love them. And that's what I would choose to do. Because at the end of the day, you know, whether the world ends and Christ comes, one thing I am sure, in my lifetime, I will meet Jesus. Now, I might be wrong about all this. And all this Christianity thing is BS. And all this meeting Jesus in heaven is BS. And when we die, we just simply become fertilizer or we just become dust. Well, then that's what it is. In the meantime, though, I'm not taking a chance. Because I choose to follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus, I choose to obey his commandment. Because he tells me how he wants me to follow him. And he tells me to love and love. And that's what I do. You know, I always say, I relate a lot of things to court trials because I've been involved in two of them. So I always ask people this question. 
if you were ever being charged for being a Christian, if the charges against you were that you were a Christian and that was a crime, punishable by death, the question is, will those people charging you find enough evidence to convict you? Will there be enough evidence of you being a Christian to convict you? Or would you be acquitted because the only thing about being a Christian that really applies to you is that you call yourself one. But there's no evidence of anything else besides that. Because the moment you open your mouth and you say hateful thing about anybody, you're disqualified. Now, will that prevent you from going to hell? I'm not God. I have no idea who's going to go, who's not going to go. I pray that from my knowledge of what Jesus tells me, that I will go, but I have no idea either. So I live my whole life not trying to get into heaven, but just simply being a good follower. You know, that's all. I want one day, if I meet my Savior, that he will look at me and say, well done. You love the unlovable. Because that's what Jesus did. He loved those that were trying to kill him. He, do he loved those. Now, did he think like them? Did he have differences with them? Did he point out those differences? Yes. But at the end of the day, he loved them. No greater love has a man seen than he who lays down his life for his brother. Now, I know what it is to lay down your life for something or someone. I did. Thank God it didn't take my life. But I was willing to die in the Panamanian prison because I believed in what I was standing for. And I was willing to die for people that, you know, most likely were going to betray me. And most of them did. But it didn't matter because I did it for what I believe. I did it for my children. I did it for my integrity. I did it because I had to look at myself in the mirror and ask myself, did I do the right thing? See, it was even in the eyes of the world, but in my eyes, I was standing up for integrity. I was standing up for my word. I was standing up for the fact that one day, no one would point a finger at my children and say their father ratted anybody else, or their father did this, or their father betrayed this, or their father cheated someone. That's why perhaps I'm 67, and no one's ever been able to point a finger at me. Not because I care whether people point a finger at me or not. People will talk because people just like to talk. But at the end of the day, what I pray that most people say about me is that I help people. That I was a man of my word. That my yes was yes. My no was no. That I love people. And that I did everything I could at all times to help people. I'm so thankful that as of now, as of the end of May of the year 23, 2023, we have sent over 160,000 books to 795 prisons across America. Books to prisoners. Because see, one of the questions that Jesus asked us is, when did you visit me when I was hungry? When did you clothe me when I was naked? And when did you visit me in prison? If you are to face Jesus right now, can you answer yes to any of those? Because when people came back and said to him, Lord, when did we see you naked, hungry, and in prison? He said, when you do it unto the least of mine, you've done it unto me. You know, I recently just learned, I live in Orlando. In 2022, 67%, I mean homeless, homeless people, Homeless increased by 67%. People that went from living normal life or on the edge to become homeless. Mothers, single mom, elderly, in a state of so much wealth. So many people that are homeless. Do you know that I also learned that in Orlando, if a person is to be able to afford to live in an apartment, a livable apartment, not a wealthy apartment, not a rich apartment, just a livable apartment, bathroom, kitchen, you know, just your basic. 
a minimum wage, that person would have to work over 107 hours a week. Over 107 hours a week to afford to live in an apartment. Isn't that embarrassing? Isn't that shameful? We have so much money. We eat so well. So many of us struggle with weight. So many of us struggle with so many things. But we never think about the homeless, the orphan, the widow, the prisoner. We talk about politics so much. And we've given political candidates hundreds of millions of dollars. But most of us cannot say that they, we've given $100 to help someone not become homeless or to feed an elderly or to house an orphan. You can say that. So we need to ask ourselves those hard questions. Because you know, life is very short. We're here today, no guarantee of tomorrow. I, I've spoken to very, very well. I had a very good friend of mine that I love dearly. Multi, multi-millionaire. Spoke to him at 9.30 in the morning, mid-50s, died by 10.30 that morning. I spoke to another great, great friend of mine. 10 o'clock in the morning, by 9 o'clock, he was in an airplane crash and died. Life is quick. If the calendar doesn't go by as fast as it goes, and yesterday we're 50, today we're 60, tomorrow we'll be 70, 80, 90, and then we're gone. If the calendar doesn't take us, so many different circumstances can and will take us. So think about that. Think about what you do when the end of time comes. If you're being charged for being a Christian, or if you're being charged for being a decent person, will there be enough evidence to convict you? Be blessed.